Hi, WorkWell listeners. I'm really excited to share that my book, Work Better Together, is officially out. Conversations with WorkWell guests and feedback from listeners like you inspired this book. It's all about how to create a more human-centered workplace. And as we return to the office for many of us, this book can help you move forward into post-pandemic life with strategies and tools to strengthen your relationships and focus on your well-being. It's available now from your favorite book retailer. There are a lot of self-help philosophies out there, but some aren't actually very helpful. We all want to become better people, but we also need to acknowledge that growth isn't always sunshine and rainbows. It's actually hard work, and it's pretty often very uncomfortable. But sometimes we need to face the hard truths if we really want to make progress and change our lives for the better. This is the WorkWell podcast series. Hi, I'm Jen Fisher, Chief Wellbeing Officer for Deloitte, and I'm so pleased to be with you today to talk about all things well-being. I'm here with Mark Manson. He's a three-time number one New York Times bestselling author, most known for his book, The Subtle Art of Not Giving a Fuck. Mark started as a blogger back in 2007, and within a few years, his blog was being read by more than a million people each month. Today, his website is read by more than 15 million people each year. Recently, he launched the Subtle Art School, a collection of video courses that deep dive into some of his favorite topics that help people lead better lives. Mark, welcome to the show. It's great being here. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. So, I want to get started. You say on your website that your life's mission is to improve the public conversation around personal development and happiness. So tell me about that. Tell me how that became your passion and why it's so important to you. I So a little bit of my background, I was a little bit of a self-help junkie when I was a teenager and young adult. And I became kind of disillusioned with it. Um, th- this was back in the 2000s, uh, and everything was still very, you know, woo woo. Just think positive. Just believe in yourself. The secret was huge. Um, and to be frank, I just thought a lot of it was nonsense. Like I, I kind of came to the conclusion through my own experiences that most of it was designed to make you feel good for a short period of time, but it wasn't actually fixing or changing anything in your life. And actually, on the contrary, to fix to change something in your life, it's actually a very difficult and painful process. Uh, And so when I started writing, I kind of took it as my mission to uh, flip the the conventional narrative around what self-improvement is. It's not a weekend retreat. It's not a seminar. It's not uh, this epiphany and this breakthrough that you're going to run down the street and frolic in the sunshine and everything. It's usually a, a slow, grueling process full of doubt, second guesses. Uh, and, and in many cases, we, we often don't even realize how much we're changing as we're changing. And mm-hmm. so um, my work is very much just about kind of the gritty, realistic aspects of personal growth. So- Let's talk more about that because you you say that you give life advice that doesn't suck. <laughs> and I and I think that we all need a little bit of life advice right now that doesn't suck. So tell me tell me more about that. You know, a big part of my work is irreverence and humor. And also yeah. I'm a little bit confrontational. I, I've just found that, you know, if you're asking people to think about really uncomfortable topics in their own lives, you know. Why did your marriage fail? Why do you always doubt yourself? Uh, why do you always feel insecure in every business meeting that you're going into? You know, it, it's these are not fun things to think about. Mm-hmm. In fact, most of us spend most of our time avoiding thinking about these things every chance we get. So I, I've kind of found that humor and a little bit of of that attitude is <sighs> is. It's kind of the sugar that helps the medicine go down. If you're how if you if you want people to confront these difficult conversations, if you can make them laugh a little bit first, um, it it's much easier to get them to do it. 
well, and I think it also, at least from my perspective, I mean, it it humanizes it a little bit, right? These are issues that are that are part of being human. These are things For that, sure. that that these are issues that we all face in one way or another, right? Not maybe not everybody's marriage fails, but we all have you know, things that we need to deal with um, or insecurities or, you know, different things in our life that we probably rather not deal with. But in order to, you know, in order to live a good life and move past them, we need to deal with them. Yeah. And and that ties back into kind of improving the just general conversation or the, the public perception of self-improvement is that these are unbelievably normal experiences yeah. that we all have uh and, you know we shouldn't treat them as these kind of special cosmic events it's like no everybody maybe you didn't lose a marriage but everybody's lost a relationship everybody right. has felt deeply insecure in certain situations everybody has had massive failures in their life and the more you can normalize that um the better everybody is for it so tell me like Walk me through the like the nitty gritty of your philosophy around self help, if you will, and and like I mean, you you talked about it a little bit, but how does it differ in terms of putting things into action? Well, I I actually kind of conceptualize my work as you know there were actually a couple of years there where I, I conceptualized it as negative self help because I. Mm-hmm. I tend to come at things instead of coming at, at things from the positive angle, I tend to come at them from the more negative angle, which uh, sounds kind of dreary and unexciting on the surface. But um, I, I actually think it's it's much more helpful. So one of the main ideas of my work is that we are all flawed and screwed up. So let's let's like not even start at the baseline expectation that we shouldn't be screwed up. We're all screwed up and we've all got baggage and messes in our past and horrible, horrible uh, insecurities going on inside of us. So, so like, let's use that as our starting point. And instead of trying to be spectacular and amazing and perfect all the time, let's just try to be less awful. Um, Take it, you know, one step at a time. Another tenet that I, I preach a lot is pain is inevitable, uh, but our reaction to that pain is not. Um, life is always going to find ways to hurt you and trip you up, but you, what you do with that uh, is completely up to you. Um, and I think this plays out in, in all sorts of different dimensions. You know, it, it, it's... It, whether it's your career or your relationships or just, you know, figuring out what you want in your life, you're, you're always going to go through periods where you feel a little bit lost, um, where there's lots of conflict, um, where something that you really, really believed in for a long time doesn't work or turns out not to be the thing that you expected it to be. Um, and again, I think it's kind of resetting expectations that this is the norm, like the, in in business, nobody thinks they're going to get the product right on the first try. Like you, you do prototypes and beta tests and you get customer feedback and you iterate like a dozen times before you get close to something that, that even resembles a successful product. And, and I, for some reason, we don't adopt those assumptions for our, our, our own mm-hmm. lives. Like you, you're not going to, your first relationship Mo, 99% of us, it's not going to work the first time. Like you're going to have, it's going to fail. You're going to have to work at it. You're going to have to go date other people, you know, whatever. Uh, so that that's in a nutshell, that is kind of just the, the dead horse I'm beating all the time. <laughs> and do you think that kind of your style and this philosophy is just reflective of you and your personality or is it something else? <laughs> I mean, I, I, I'm, I'm kind of a cynical dude, um, for sure. You know, it's, I'm a millennial, um, millennials are kind of famous for being cynical and, and disillusioned so. with, with everything. <laughs> yeah. And, and I think that's, that's kind of, that was my initial audience early on. You know, mm-hmm. I started blogging in 2008 right. and, um, 
you know, that that's where it caught on. I mean, now, now it's every generation is, is reading my stuff, but early on, that was kind of the bread and butter. It's just a bunch of disaffected millennials who <laughs> were upset with the world. <laughs> well, it obviously resonates, right? Because you have millions and millions of people reading your stuff now. So I, I guess, you know, when you, when you talk about like, what are some specific strategies? So, you know, you, you kind of said, look, life is going to trip you up. Like that's life. There are parts of life regardless of who you are, what you do, what your title is, where you live, who you're married to or not, you know, life is going to trip you up. There's parts of life that suck. Um, that's just a reality, but it's our reaction to these things or how we choose to deal with them. So talk to me about some of the strategies that you share with people or you help people to cultivate and develop that help them deal with, you know, the suck of life. <laughs> <laughs> well, the, the first one and probably primary one that I believe very strongly in is a sense of radical responsibility, um, mm. t taking responsibility for every experience in your life. And where people get tripped up on that is we often associate responsibility with fault or we associate responsibility with, with justice. You know, it, it's if I'm walking down the street and a car a drunk driver runs off the road and hits me. It's not my fault that that happened. Mm. It's not fair or just that that happened to me, but it is still my responsibility to, uh, to recover, to re recuperate, to process the experience, to decide what, what is that experience going to mean in my life? How is this going to affect my future? What am I going to learn from it? How am I going to respond and bounce back? Those things are still my responsibility regardless. I think the, the, the example I use in my book was if somebody leaves a baby on your doorstep, it's not your fault that the baby's there, but it is sure as hell your responsibility to do something about it. Mm -hmm. And I think most problems in life are like this. Uh, mo a lot of many, many problems that happen or struggles that we're faced with, they're not our fault. And they're not fair, but that doesn't mean that we don't get to be responsible for them. And I harp on this a lot because until you take ownership of whatever you're going through, you're essentially just giving away your personal power to others. Um, so if I decide, well, it's not my fault the car hit me, there's nothing I can do, then I'm just going to sit in a hospital bed and wait for something to happen. Um, it, it's, it's by taking ownership of our experiences and deciding that I'm the, I am responsible for this, no matter how sucky it is, um, that it opens the door to making better decisions, to planning better futures, to uh, constructing better meaning from our experiences. And so how do we do that? Because <laughs> it sounds fabulous, but like in con like conceptually, yes, absolutely. But that's not the kind of natural human tendency. Sure. So one way I think this this concept actually plays out in our brains is I, I talk about this idea that we are always choosing in every moment. So mm -hmm. Not only are we, we may not choose what's happening to us, but we are always choosing how to interpret and react to what's happening to us. Um, we're always choosing the meaning that we ascribe to what's happening to us. And so I think the first step is simply just becoming aware of those choices that we're making. Uh, and, and because once we're aware of them, we can start that process of choosing something different. Mm. Um, and I, I think this is just like the probably the most fundamental thing that we all continue to, sh to struggle with, because like you said, our default setting is that our life is happening to us. It's not something that we're uh, proactively creating. And once you become aware of all those micro choices happening in every moment, then you can start to develop that sense of like, okay, I am actually creating the life that I have. Yeah. So uh, let's kind of talk about um, 
happiness and, you know, this constant pursuit of, of happiness that so many of us are, you know, kind of always chasing, I guess, Mm -hmm. or I guess, are we, are we like, are we just trying too hard to be happy? (laughs) Like, and, and like, what's the fine line between, you know, I, I like caring about what really matters and then being able to like let all the other stuff go. <laughs> mm-hmm. You're right. I I I personally believe that that happiness is a bit overrated uh as something to pursue or something to worry about mm-hmm. particularly. You know, in my opinion, it's if you get the other things right, happiness will naturally happen as a byproduct. Um so and again, I think this is the advantage of coming at things from more of a negative angle. I think it's it's more worthwhile to ask, well, first of all, no emotion ever lasts. So even if you are happy, if everything in your life's going great, it's not going to last. Something's right. going to happen. Right. Something's going to change. Um, it, it's inevitable. And so I think the 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 since happiness is a moving target, we need to ask ourselves, what are we willing to be unhappy for? What are the things in our lives that we're willing to sacrifice or struggle or suffer for? What what are the things in our life that are actually more important than our own happiness? And for a lot of people, that's something like their kids, their family, um, maybe a particular cause. You know, maybe they believe really strongly in their career. Uh, but most of us, we don't have many of those things. We have, you know, we're lucky if we have more than one or two. And a lot of people have none. And what I find is that the people who have none, they have, there's nothing that they're willing to give up their happiness for. They are the ones who are constantly struggling to be happy. Uh, mm-hmm. Because if you have nothing that you're willing to give up happiness for, then happiness, it kind of becomes like... Uh, chasing highs it becomes it's like a promise it's 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 like (laughs) it's like a low it's like a kind of an abstract addiction like you're always looking for a new distraction uh a new a a new thrill um a new escape Mm -hmm. um and so it i think it's one of those paradoxical things that the more you find that you're willing to be unhappy for, the more happiness just starts to happen naturally as a byproduct. So do you, let's talk about social media and the role that social media plays in kind of this constant pursuit of, you know, the perfect life or happiness. You know, we're, we're all aware that, you know, what we see um, oftentimes or all the time on social media is a curated version of somebody else's life. And although we know that, um, it still, you know, triggers a very human response of, you know, comparing it to my own life or my own happiness. And so what is the role that social media kind of plays in, you know, where we are now and our like constant pursuit or desire to always be happy. Mm -hmm. You know, to be honest, I think, so social media is kind of like a favorite punching bag these days. And, um, and rightfully so, like, I I do think there are are some (laughs) things, there are some things that social media deserves to be kicked around for. Um, I, I'm not convinced that that is so much one of them. You know, keeping up with the Joneses has always been a thing. Yeah, yeah. Um, and and if it wasn't social media, it would be TV commercials or magazine ads or you know radio shows or whatever. Um, so is it is it just us looking for something outside of ourselves to blame? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, we're human, right? So we yeah. always we we're going to we're naturally going to compare ourselves to others and when we see somebody who has something that we don't have, we're going to be a little bit envious and have those questions of like, you know, why don't I have that? Am I not good enough? And and I think that's just kind of a universal experience. I mean, social media might make it more uh like more frequent, a more frequent mm-hmm. experience for people, but I don't think it it is necessarily you know causing it or or changing it. To me, the the actually the big 
threat of social media or the problem with social media is that it's kind of, it's a funhouse mirror reflection of reality. Like it's the same way, you know, obviously it's not all those like, like if I get on Facebook, so I'm in my mid thirties. So when I get on Facebook, it's just nothing but weddings and babies, like Mm. top to bottom (laughs) weddings and babies. And you would think that just everybody's getting married and having kids right now when, you know, the reality is, is life, I'm just not seeing all of the boring mundane things or people aren't posting the boring mundane things from their lives. Um, and I think this goes both ways. I think we get overexposed to the extremely positive events and we get overexposed to extremely yeah. negative events and points of view as well. And meanwhile, it's like 99% of life is happening in this humdrum in middle. Yeah. <laughs> and and we're not being exposed to that. So our perception of the world, I think, gets very skewed uh, in both directions. Yeah, I, 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 that that really resonates with me. And and one of the other things that I know you talk about, and you've touched on this a little bit, is that you know we aren't going to feel amazing all of the time, and this expectation that we are kind of leads us down, you know, a. a a bad path. Like we're not going to, not every experience is going to be positive. You talked about that already, but Mm -hmm. like, can you dive a little bit deeper and talk about like, why we all, like, why do we all need to better understand this or what can we do to kind of better understand this and, and help one another? I mean, I think for me, you know, like logically, yeah, I get that. I understand that. But when it comes to like my own life or um, practices in my own life, it doesn't, it doesn't necessarily seem to feel that way. <laughs> <laughs> I saw, um, I, I don't remember where it was, but I saw, I saw an interview of a, an Olympic, uh, uh, sorry, an Olympic athlete recently. And she, I think she was a gymnast and she said that her coach told her, she said that one day she went in and had had a horrible practice, was just like missing all of her jumps or whatever. And her and she was really upset with herself. And her coach, she thought her coach was gonna chew her out. And uh and he didn't. He was actually really nice to her and she was kind of surprised. And and she said that her coach was like, Oh, it's just uh it's it's the it's the one third rule. And mm. she was like, What's what's the one third rule? And he and he said, Well, if you do something long enough and frequently enough, a third of the time, you're going to feel great about it. A third of the time, it's just going to be whatever. Okay. You know, a normal day. And a third of the time, you're going to feel like you're sucking and that it's not good enough. And it doesn't really matter how hard you're trying or like, you know, you could try to hack everything you want, but it's just, that's how you're going to show up mentally each time. And I really like frameworks like that because it's, it basically resets our expectations. You know, one of the things that I say, uh, in one of my articles is I said that even if you're working your dream job, it's still going to suck about 10% of the time Mm -hmm. and because no job is perfect all the time. And I can attest to that. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Right. Me too. Me too. And, and it's, I think it's just to me. So just actually to give you a a concrete example earlier this week, I, on Monday, I woke up, uh, with the sniffles, started coughing. Turns out I'm sick. It's not COVID, but it turns out, it turns out I'm sick. I'm in the middle of a a really big kind of business rebrand with Mm -hmm. my team. I'm working long hours. I'm like, wow, this is the worst time ever to get sick. Uh, I, I struggle through the morning. Um, afternoon comes, I get the mail. I've got a big envelope from the IRS. I'm like, Oh God, here we go. <laughs> I open it up. <laughs> yeah. And guess what? I'm getting audited. And I'm like, seriously, of all times, like you could have done this three months ago or a year ago. Uh, and you know, I was, it was a pretty crappy day and I, I kind of sat down, you know, before dinner and I was like, you know what? This is just, is this is part of that 10%. Like this Mm. is just, and I, you know, the last month has been great. I've been on a roll lately. I've been super productive, been like really energized. And this week has just been the pits. And I'm like, Mm. it's just part of it. That's part of it. 
it's it's how it comes. There's nothing I need to fix. There's nothing I need. I didn't do anything wrong. I'm not a bad person. Um, this is just part of that 10 percent. So, so I, I have to ask. Do you, I guess you take you take your own advice? <laughs> <laughs> I try. I try. So, so then, of all the topics that you speak and write about in terms of giving advice to others, what what's the one that you struggle with the most? <laughs> That's a great question. Because <laughs> um, most of this stuff, I write about it because it's. I joke that it's it's my it's my form of therapy. Is it's is, a reflection is, of your own experience? Exactly. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah. it's it's like this was my big. You know, if you find an article I wrote in 2017, it's that was probably what I was struggling with in 2017. Oh. Um, you know the the thing that I'm bad about. I still I still get distracted a lot. Mm-hmm. It's it seems to be a constant battle. Um, I've written a lot the last few years about something I call the attention diet, right. which is, which is kind of like, you know, going on a fast the same way you would to like lose weight is you just like kind of block or unsubscribe to a bunch of things. Um, yeah, it's just part of my, I think it's just the nature of my profession is that I'm, I'm sitting in front of a, a computer screen with an internet connection all day, every day that you know, things seep in. My brain seems to always find a way to like, you know, some shiny new thing to. Yeah. Uh, well, and I also mean part of your success and what you do is tied to, you know, being online, right? Mm, yeah. <laughs> so, I, so it's yeah. hard not to be. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I think I, I think we all struggle with that. And I mean, whoever's curating it is doing a great job because, because we're all struggling with it. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> so one of the other things, um, you know, that kind of comes through loud and clear in terms of like a theme in, in your philosophy is self-awareness. Um, mm. You talk about this all the time or write about this all the time. So, um, you know, and, and in particular, I think like in, in terms of us defining what success looks like, what our values are, um, you know, we have to have self-awareness um, yep. and what choices and decisions that we make. So talk to me about self-awareness, um, you know, self-awareness, like many things that you talk about is hard, right? Because it means we have to get real with some of the things that aren't so great about ourselves in order to get to the things that are so great about ourselves. So how can we better align our, our, our actions with, you know, those things that, you know, that are good about us, I guess. Um, but just talk to me about (laughs) (laughs) self-awareness. Yeah. It's self-awareness is hard because we are all experts at lying to ourselves (laughs) and it's, but look, I mean, if you lack awareness around something, nothing else is going to happen. Nothing else is going to mm. work. Like, like if you aren't aware that you're having a certain emotional reaction, you can never change that emotional reaction. If you're not aware that you have an insecurity, you can't change that insecurity. If you aren't aware that you have a particular definition of success, you can't question or potentially change that definition of success. So you know, the first step to, to really anything I think is, is kind of doing a deep dive into, you know, you start with the behavior. I used to call it the why game, you know, how, you know, how like three-year-olds just walk around saying, why, <laughs> why, 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 <laughs> uh, you know, it, you kind of want to become like that, but with yourself. So, you know, you look mm-hmm. at a behavior that maybe you're not particularly proud of or don't feel great about and ask yourself why why did I do that and start looking at all the different elements and influences you know maybe you were probably you were overwhelmed by some sort form of emotion maybe you're underslept maybe you are around people you don't like and then you take all those reasons and you ask why again okay why am I around people I don't like uh why am I underslept why why did I have why was I overwhelmed by this emotion? And you get another set of answers, you know, it's, uh, and, and usually they're particularly deeper answers. You know, maybe I'm, maybe I'm in a job I don't like, or maybe I, uh, am not taking care of my health. Or maybe I'm, uh, I've always struggled with anger and I've never addressed it, you know, and then you ask why again, and you, you basically kind of just go down these rabbit holes, um, jur- you know, a journal is a great medium mm-hmm. to do this, yeah. uh, but therapy as well, 
obviously, um, or just talking to a loved one or partner. Um, but just follow that those rabbit holes as, as deep as you, you can take and, um, and just see what comes up because, you know, just a simple thing of like noticing, wow, you know, like the last three or four times I had outbursts like this, I was with this one person. Like, that's probably not a coincidence. What is it about that one person that it like brings this out of me? Um, a realization like that can be really pivotal, uh, pivotal for somebody. Uh, and it, it's, uh, you know, and I, I just think it's a really important mental process to kind of develop on yourself. And, and can that help us also, um, and kind of speaking from what I struggle with in my own experiences and, you know, it just the the title of your of your most famous book like how do we actually go through the process of like not caring about things <laughs> <laughs> well i i you know the trick and, and it's not as simple as that i get it of but. course of course <laughs> i mean you know the sh- the short answer is is you have to care about things it's just right. a question it's a question of what what you're choosing to care about you know the the short version uh of the the how to stop how to stop caring so much um the trick is is to find something to care about that's just way way more important Mm. um yeah i did a video recently and i used the example i said you know let's 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 use the hypothetical situation that a lot of people experience of like you know so and so you know there's people like at school or at work or something who who are mean to you or like saying not, saying bad things about you and you're really upset about it and it just kind of consumes you and it like eats you up and you're like what what did i do wrong like why is this such a problem why who why why don't people like me and you're like having the whole pity parade and everything oh yeah um, i've been there yeah we've all done it we've all <laughs> we've all been there um and i said now imagine that your mother has cancer. Mm. How important is what those people are saying? That's right. It's not important at all. You don't care anymore because you're like so consumed by this other thing that's a hundred times, a million times more important. And is actually um, important. <laughs> it is actually important, right? Yeah. So the problem isn't that like, oh, I care too much that people say bad things about me. The problem is that you don't have something a million times more important than people saying Mm. bad things about you. Uh, And so the trick is to find that thing that is a million times more important. And then suddenly you're like, okay, well, whatever. People are saying bad things about me. Who cares? Interesting. Well, and I guess hopefully more times, maybe this is just me being you know, toxic positivity, but hopefully more times than not, that thing that's a million times more important isn't always something like somebody having cancer. <laughs> yeah, right. As a cancer I mean, survivor, I can say that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, it, it, it can be positive or negative. It, yeah, it, yeah. You know, it, it can be, uh, it can be a cause, it can be a mission. You know, I, I think, you know, ultimately, you know, mission is a buzzword that gets thrown a lot thrown around a lot uh you know purpose is another one but uh, you know i to me this is the practical value of those things when you feel as though you have a purpose and a mission in your life um then that's what makes all the small stuff kind of just fade into the background and and it's true i mean it's true what your parents told you not everybody's gonna like you i mean that's yeah. part of life <laughs> yep for sure <laughs> And we don't like everybody, right? So, you know. <laughs> <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> to kind of flip that around a little bit. So in your kind of in your experiences and the people you're interacting with and the, the, the millions of people that, you know, kind of follow you and that followership continues to grow, do you, I mean, the, the world is kind of rough right now. It has been mm-hmm. for, you know, or feels like it's been more rough, at least for the past few years. Um, but it's probably kind of always been there in some sense. But do you think people are struggling more now in the past? And, and if the answer is yes, why do you think that is? Oh, man. <laughs> That's a loaded question. <laughs> this is, yeah. I mean, we we could do a whole podcast just on this question. <laughs> you know, so I, I'm actually really undecided about this. Mm-hmm. Um 
so mental health statistics have been on a steady yeah. march in the wrong direction for basically as long as they've been measuring mental health statistics. Yeah. So everything from depression and anxiety and addiction and eating disorders, like all these things have been, are just on multi-decade, multi-generational declines. But there's a lot of debate over why that is. Uh, you know, one reason is there's just way more diagnosis happening. There's way more therapists and psychiatrists. It's way more socially acceptable to, you know, 50 years ago, if you were depressed, it wasn't really socially acceptable to talk about it uh, or to go see a therapist. Uh, whereas today, you know, everybody has a therapist. Everybody goes, you know, talks about a lot of their mental health issues. So it's a question of like, is there actually more or are we simply more open about it and and measuring it better um yeah i to me it's just it's an open question i think yeah. i i am i find that i'm i think it's very easy to become pessimistic because we are so much more aware of problems these days again with the internet um we're so much more exposed to people struggling and suffering um all over the world. But on the other hand, it's if you actually, you know, if you go back a few generations and actually look at how they lived, I I, I don't know about you, but I've had this experience <laughs> recently where I've watched some classic movies, like mm -hmm. films that were made in the 50s, 60s, and 70s, and been absolutely appalled by the characters' behaviors. <laughs> Just yeah. been like yeah. horrified at how cruel they are to each other and themselves how much they drink how much they smoke how like the awful things that they say to each other and and then realizing like wow that is that was actually normal back then like that was right and we, and we tend to i think human nature is to kind of have this i i kind of this I rosy like, yeah picture. exactly yeah, of the, of for the sure. past that it was you know and it's also interesting that you say that because um you know deloitte came out with a, a study on um, the C, the C-suite's role in well-being. And one of the stats that, that, um, that came out is that, you know, 50% of the workforce, you know, says that they're struggling or struggling with their, with their mental health um, and the mm -hmm. workplace. But that also means that 50% of the workforce isn't struggling. And while I'm not trying to downplay those that are, because it's incredibly important and we need to focus and pay attention there, we don't often hear about the people that aren't struggling. And Adam Grant recently actually talked about it. And he's like, I wonder, you know, I wonder why we don't hear that. Is it that the people that are struggling, you know, they're afraid to say something and the people that are also not struggling are afraid to say something. And so now yeah. nobody's kind of really saying anything, right? <laughs> yeah, so yeah. could the people that are struggling learn from the people that aren't struggling? Is there a way to actually create more of an open dialogue that it's okay to not be struggling? Because I think we hear so much about, well, everybody's struggling. So therefore, if I'm not, then I'm not going to say anything because I don't want anybody to know that I'm not struggling. <laughs> so, the, you know, this, this actually, this ties it re in really well to how we started the conversation, which is, like you just said, it's if we normalize struggling to such an extent that people are just kind of like, well, yeah, I'm always struggling with something. Like there's always something hard going on in my life. Um, you know, how, how useful is that as a metric? Yeah. Uh, you know, I did a newsletter a couple of years ago about, um, the, the expansion of, of meaning of certain words. So like for mm. instance, tr trauma, like 40 years ago, trauma had a very, very narrow specific meaning. Um, and then it expanded and then it expanded again. And, and now it's like, you know, people will just, casually uh throw around you know oh i was traumatized by that you know that movie was terrible i it, it was traumatic watching it you know it, it's the word words become more common and then their the definition of those words becomes more ex expansive and uh cast a wider net of a wider variety of experiences and then they lose their meaning 
Yeah, then you wonder, are you measuring the same thing that you were measuring yeah. 40 years ago, right? Yeah. And that yeah. and that all that also ties in back to these metrics of like, you know, what depression has gone through a, a similar evolution, you know, depression 50 years ago, depression was like, you literally could not get out of bed. Right. Uh, you could not function. And today, it, there's plenty of people who are who are depressed, but still, you know, are functional in their daily lives. Um so yeah, it just it, again, I don't know the answer to any of this stuff, but right. I think I think it's a um, there's a lot of interesting open questions around this and it's uh you know, I don't think anybody knows. Well, maybe honestly. we'll we'll loop back in the future for another another podcast on this topic. <laughs> yeah, I'm I'm sure it'll be interesting regardless. Yeah. Yeah. So, one one final question for you, Mark. Um, you know, you you've been incredibly successful. I I don't know if you know when you set out to do what you're doing, you thought that you would impact as many people's lives as you have. So first of all, congratulations on that. But really, what I want to know, like what if like what have you learned from the success that you've had, and like what has actually surprised you about it? Like, are there any stories from people that have been so impacted by your work or something you did or said or something they learned from you? Like, is there anything that's just really like touched you or surprised you about um, the work that you're doing? I'm going to, I'm going to take that question in, in two parts. Yeah. Cause um, it was kind of a three parter actually. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's so with the audience, you know, the audience it's, it's, it's a very interesting experience. I'm going to be very honest here. So, you know, I, early on, you know, when I'm just a blogger with a couple dozen readers and a few commenters, you know, it's every positive reaction is shocking. It's like, Mm -hmm. oh my God, this guy in Illinois just said that this article, like, you know, helped him out. Oh, wow. Oh, you know, it's (laughs) like that. That's so crazy. That's amazing. I can't believe it. You know, and then like anything else though, things kind of, you, you become kind of desensitized and mm. a nerd, a nerd to things. And, you know, a, as the audience has grown and exploded over the year, you know, I've, I've heard crazy, crazy stories, both positive and negative. Um, I've been parts of people's proposals. Uh, it's, like 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 marriage proposals marriage proposals <laughs> oh my god <laughs> uh, it, it, it's like there's really really just insane amazing stuff that that has happened and, and continues to happen you know with readers and it, it's just such a blessing and it's um and yeah it, the first time each one happens it's surprising and then but it's just human nature you know it's after after three or four marriage proposals, you're kind of like, <laughs> you know, or like another one, you oh, know, another one. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Or, or another one is, um, you know, people who the people have emailed me and they said, you know, I was suicidal and then I found your work and I'm not anymore. Mm. And like that, that is always incredible, but it's, and the first few times it's extremely surprising. Um, Do you feel like a huge sense of responsibility when you get something like that? Yes, a sensor yeah. that that is like that is uh, an occupational hazard of yeah, the in, yeah. the industry I'm in for sure. Um, <laughs> but it, it's you know so there's this weird kind of uh, almost objectification of you know audience experience that you just develop. You know I've been doing this for 15 years, and so everything it kind of just turns into data. Um, which is sad in a way, like I wish that wasn't true, but it's also just, you know, when you hear from tens of thousands of people over many, many years, like it, I think it's natural. Yeah. Um, and honestly, if I, and if, if it didn't become that way, I probably couldn't do this job. I would be so overwhelmed with anxiety and emotion all the time that I wouldn't be able to write anymore. Um, On a personal, so I guess maybe that's the surprising part. Um, On a personal level, uh, yeah, my success is completely surprising. I I I often joke that if anybody actually thinks they're going to sell this many books, uh, they're probably an (laughs) asshole. Um, (laughs) But it's 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 
what surprised me actually has been the other side, like being on the other side of success. You know, there's a lot of cliches of like money doesn't make you happy. And, Mm -hmm. but, but the, the biggest, you know, and that's all true, but the biggest surprise for me was, um, I had a dream. I worked towards that dream and I hit it way younger than I ever thought I would. Mm -hmm. And when I hit it, I lost it. And, and that really messed me up like being still being young and not having a dream anymore um, and not knowing what to do next and, and having this kind of like sinking feeling of like anything you do next is going to be disappointing to everyone, including yourself. Um, (laughs) It's that, that really messed me up uh, for a few years, uh, which is really strange. Like I, I, um, I had a, I had a year after the book blew up that was, kind of like emotionally difficult so that was a surprise on the personal level yeah i can i can understand that and thank you for sharing that well mark i have enjoyed it immensely i know the listeners will too so thank you again for being on the show absolutely thanks for having me i'm so grateful mark could be with us today to talk about happiness and personal development Thank you to our producers, Rivet360, and our listeners. You can find the WorkWell podcast series on Deloitte.com, or you can visit various podcatchers using the keyword WorkWell, all one word, to hear more. And if you like the show, don't forget to subscribe so you get all of our future episodes. If you have a topic you'd like to hear on the WorkWell podcast series, or maybe a story you would like to share, please reach out to me on LinkedIn. My profile is under the name Jen Fisher, or on Twitter at jenfish23. We're always open to your recommendations and feedback. And of course, if you like what you hear, please share, post, and like this podcast. Thank you and be well. The information, opinions, and recommendations expressed by guests on this Deloitte podcast series are for general information and should not be considered as specific advice or services.